first of all, it took me almost six or seven years to write, write research and write this thing. And research is very important. Uh, but uh, I have a, a job, a lot of people don't realize it. I, uh, I'm a consultant for NBC for sports, ironically, which is the thing I always wanted to do, for on air people around the country. So I go to different towns. Uh, I travel, I try to travel, not a lot, but I, I've been traveling a lot lately. And so uh, I go to San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, Washington, and uh, the Golf Channel in Florida, which sounds like a fun job, but I'm really just in an air-conditioned building. Uh, so, I, so I've been working, plus you know, I do work for KYW Radio, and, uh, TV show, and, uh, and once you write a book, then you have to, if you write a book and really care about it, you have to promote it. So signings like this are very important. This is also my home store. Five six minutes away. So if you know anybody who wants the book, and you couldn't make it today. If they come here and they want it signed, personalized, they'll leave it for them here uh, because I I go by here every day. So this is my own store, and uh, it's an important one for me. And uh, where is everybody from the neighborhood here, or just around? Philly, Philadelphia. Yeah, this is a beautiful store. It's a very good store for. Uh, little children, the toddlers, it's, it's really spectacular. Anyway, so I'm here and uh, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the book and how it came about. And then, you want to start now? Yes. And then, if you have any questions, don't be bashful. Uh, those of you who know anything about my career, you know that I'm very straightforward. Uh, I uh, came here in 1966. I was 23 years old. And uh, Two years earlier, I traveled with the Beatles, first time. And it was a very unlikely thing for me because uh, uh, I'm not really a musical kind of person. I love music, but I'm not, I don't have a lot of rhythm. And uh, when what happened, very simply to give you the story, is that in 1964, they came to Miami on a very quick trip. This is their, when they went on the Ed Sullivan Show. And when they came to Miami, I did a quick interview with them. Just as an assignment, I was the news director of the, I was 21, I was the news director of the station. And I met them, then I saw them in concert doing the Ed Sullivan show from a hotel uh, called the Deauville Hotel in Miami. And that was it. And 1964 was a very big year in America. We had just witnessed the uh, killing of President Kennedy. So the world was trying to recoup from that. Uh, the war was escalating in Vietnam. Uh, racial polarization in America was getting worse. The civil rights movement was getting very active. Uh, the Mustang, as a car was released, was a revol right, revolutionary car. Uh, and it was a very busy time for me because something else was happening in my life. The Cuban population was coming to America in very quick numbers because Fidel Castro was uh, running a reign of terror in Cuba. So there's very, you can come in and sit down if you like, it's okay. You know. Okay, good. Um, and uh, it was a very, very, very important time in American history. Uh, people were very upset after the assassination. Uh, it, was, it was just amazing. The Vietnam War was really getting out of control. And uh, the Beatles came to America and they asked me, my bosses, to write a letter to Brian Epstein, their manager. And the letter was... Uh, the idea of the letter was to get an interview with them in Jacksonville, which was the closest place they were coming to Miami on their big summer tour, which in those days was the biggest tour in the history of music. Nothing was ever close to it. 36 days, 25 cities. And uh, so I wrote a letter, and in the letter I put down, I put in letters from uh, kids from around the country uh, and the area, and the letters were all perfumed mostly from girls, and, uh, and, they, and they had this, this most amazing tone to them. The letter said, uh, uh, please pass this on to the Beatles, tell Paul that I will meet him somewhere in New York. <laughs> These are coming from 13-year-old girls, from your age. Uh, and, uh, and so I said, you know, this is the kind of fervor we have. Anyway, so I get a letter back from Epstein saying to me, we'd love to have you join us on August 18th in San Francisco and, and travel in our official traveling party 
Uh, in our cars, we'll provide the transportation. Your luggage will be picked up. Uh, you'll be traveling with the boys, as they call them. That's why the book is called When They Were Boys, because they, they didn't say, come on over here, Beetle or Beetles. They called them the boys. That's the way their, their friends called them. So uh, I didn't want to go. Uh, I basically said to the owners of the station um, that the, the fee was $3,000, okay, for 36 days of travel. Imagine, okay, imagine that. So uh, I didn't want to go, and I basically said, look, send a DJ. And they said, no, no, you're a news guy. We want somebody who can tell the story and find the stories. And I said, let's face it, you and I both know that this band is going to be here in September and gone in November. And, and that just shows you how smart I really was. Uh, I eventually was uh, forced to go. I arrived in San Francisco on September 8th. August 18th, 1964. Uh, I can't tell you the full story here of what happened that day, but uh, because of the age, age appropriate comments I want to make, but I, I was in a hotel, and I will just say this. Uh, I, I opened my hotel room, and it was the same floor as the Beatles. They were in the same floor, and I had never really had an intimate conversation with them before, I just met them briefly. And when I was when I when I opened the door, there was a woman, a very attractive young lady. Well, not young to me. I would say an older woman, maybe 30. I was uh, 21, and she was very, very pretty and very, very vivacious. And she said to me, and I'll try to make it in special terms here, Mr. Kane, uh, I want to make you happy, so you'll meet, get me to meet the Beatles tonight. Immediately, immediately, I got scared and, because I'm not, you know, that kind of guy, and also. Now, the men, of course, the, the men in the room are saying how stupid was he. <laughs> and the women are saying something wrong. Uh, uh, he's okay. So anyway, that was that. The phone rings. I remember. She could have been a stalker. She could have been somebody irresponsible. I didn't know who she was. The phone rings, and it's their press secretary inviting me to come down to the room. So I come down to the room, and um, it was the first opportunity for those traveling with them to meet them and, and get acquainted. It was very nice. Uh, George Harrison was a very quiet man, always very quiet. Uh, he, he never ever said much, except when one of our, we were making an emergency landing in Portland, and he screamed out to me, Larry, if anything happens, it's Beatles and children first. And, uh, he did say that, that's on tape, by the way. Uh, and, and he was very lovely, and Ringo was very friendly. You know, they just, he was, these guys were 13 months away from practically quitting. They never thought they would make it. And then I met Paul, who was always smooth. I mean, Paul McCartney never met in his life a mirror or a comb he didn't like. <laughs> and what a lovely man. And in those days, young ladies, of course, of the appropriate age. And, uh, and then I met John Lennon, and the world almost came to an end. Though there are few of you here, some of the uh, people my age, who will remember this, but I was wearing a Robert Hall suit. Remember Robert Hall? Yeah. Robert Hall was the deep, deep, deep discounter of men's fashion. And uh, I had one suit, had a couple of ties. And uh, my mother, who had died that year, uh, actually had helped me pick out the suits. It was very special to me. And John Lennon looked at me, and he looked at me from my, my shoes up to my, my head, and he said, Who are you? And I said, and, I says, and this is exactly what he said. He said, You look like a round peg in a square hole. You are a nerd from the 1950s. And so I didn't know what to say. First of all, I didn't want to be there. And I, you know, I was a hard news guy. I, I covered crime and punishment and poly corruption. And, and I said, well, you know, honestly, John, it's better than going around with that ugly hair of yours. And he looked at me. And, and then I began to interview him with my 40-pound tape recorder. Imagine taking, uh, those, those books weigh a pound each. Imagine taking about uh, 35 of them and carrying it around all day. And, uh, and I, 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 I interviewed him. I asked him about racial polarization. I asked him about the war in Vietnam. And uh, he liked it. You could tell he was liking it. But I also insulted him, so I walked out of the room. And I was very, very depressed. I said, no, I didn't think I'd ever see the inside of the airplane. Uh, first of all, I just insulted the king of the Beatles. And, and then I had this woman waiting in the room. 
knowing not what to do. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I was walking down the hall, I was really out of it, and I feel two hands on my shoulder, and somebody grabs me and spins me around, and it was John Lennon. Now, as you'll learn in this book and anything else I've written about them, John was not a higgy, uh, huggy, kissy kind of guy. He was uh, only with, he was more tuned to really be more empathetic with women. He was not the kind of guy who would touch you or grab you. And I was stunned and I said, what's going on? He said, I just wanted to tell you, and mate, he said, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I'm so sorry we had this first meeting like that. I'm really looking forward to working. And I said, wow, this guy's really a nice guy. He didn't have to do that. And so I felt much better. Then I had to deal with the, the company in the room. And uh, I looked down the hall and there was a, um, there was a, a man named Malcolm Evans who read about. He was a postal worker in Liverpool, and he became one of the Beatles' roadies, their protectors. And he was about six foot four, 220 pounds, one of the sweetest men you will ever meet in your life. When the Beatles were filming their movie Help in the Bahamas, he wanted to get away from the house, their house on the beach, and he shared a hotel room with me one night in downtown Nassau. And uh, we were close. But I, I never met him at that point. He was walking with this young lady on his arm, and she was leaning her head on the shoulder. And it was that, it was the woman from the room. <laughs> I never, ever saw her again. And, but I have a pretty good idea that she got close to meeting the Beatles. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, the next night, I was, uh, and I'm just going to pass these stories on very quickly and tell you about the book. I was at the Cow Palace, which is some of you have been to the Wells Fargo Arena here, all right? It was like a, a older version. You okay? No. You were describing it. Uh, Wells, it was an older version of, uh, of that. It was 19,000 people. And they came there and they'd never seen anything like this before. Because in all honesty, the Beatles had never, had never performed before 19,000 people, ever. And uh, so uh, I, I decided to go out in the crowd, a lot of young ladies like this, this young guy here, to see what they were doing. I was trying to figure out what is going on here. We have, is that food? Oh, yes, it's tiramisu truffles. What is it? It's tiramisu truffles. Oh, that's great. Okay. So, <laughs> save one for me, okay? So, so, uh, so anyway, thank you. So anyway, um, I, uh, I, I'm going up and down the aisle, and I'm looking at young ladies. What are you, 10? 10. They're 13, 14. And they're looking up at the crowd, looking up at the Beatles. And tears are flowing from their eyes. And I figured what it was. It wasn't crying. It was the idea that they couldn't blink. <laughs> and if you don't blink, after a while, tears come down your face. And uh, they were all convinced, I interviewed a couple of them, that each one of the Beatles was singing to that. Uh -huh. yeah. So, were you one of their fans? Or one? Uh -huh. yeah, but you're too young to be in that crowd. We've seen them, though. We've seen yeah. them. We've seen Paul since okay. night. He signed me, trust me. So he was singing to you. <laughs> and, and they were convinced. I talked to a couple, and, and they would say, I know Ringo loves me. I mean, you know, the night, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. And so that was the beginning of Beatlemania, which was fandom, you know, more of an emotional thing. The real, the real guts of the Beatles, continued later on when people started to realize their incredible music. But on that night, I was trapped in the crowd. And what happened was the next was the most, one of the most horrible things that ever happened to me at that point in my life. A bunch of kids running to the stage trampled me. And, and they ran right over me and I, I, my nose was bleeding. And uh, I stopped to the side and a very nice young man came to sit next, sit, he said, sit with me and compose yourself, sir. And I sat down with him, and this kid was not there for the Beatles. He was there for the girls. <laughs> and he had a triple-decker vanilla custard cone. And unfortunately, while I was sitting there, my nose was bleeding. Uh, the, 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 the cup, the uh, cone, was dripping from the middle. So not only did I have blood on my shirt, but I had all this stuff in my pants. <laughs> and when I first went onto the plane that night, Paul McCarthy saw me, and he said, Larry, he said, you've been a bad boy. <laughs> and it started a long joke, which I'll go into at the end here, but 